All right, so my name is Jesse, for you guys who don't know me. Um, my wife is Cindy, who would normally be sitting there, and we pretty much take up this whole row here with everybody that we have. Um, I have six kids, all girls, and I'm super blessed with that fact, because uh, boys, I don't know, from the little boys I've seen just around the world, they're just naughty. I just, I don't, I don't know how to, <laughs> I don't know how to take, take boys, that's for sure. All right, so I was gonna, when uh, Rod asked me to share a message, I was um, originally, immediately was yes, and I was going to be uh, intimacy message and, and reconnecting with God's heart, which has um, been a message that has been on my heart for a while. Um, and as the time grew closer, I was going over my message with the Lord and asking him what I should share, what I shouldn't, you know, what, what, uh, what bullseye I need and everything I need to say goes uh, straight for that. Um, and through conversations with the Lord, he was telling me, um, you know, you got a really good message. Just you've been polishing this one for a while, and um, is this is this what is this what I want you to preach? And uh, when he asked that question, you know that you got to look past yourself and look at uh, what he wants you to say. I realize I've been going to this church now for about a year. I think it's coming up on a year. Uh, feels like I've only been here a couple months. I just love this place, and uh, I love everybody in here. I love what everybody's about. I love that there's like the, the whole not paid staff thing. You know what I mean? You guys are just putting you into this church and being obedient to what God is saying. And that is a church that I want to go to. That is something I can get on board with. And I just honor you guys for all the elders and leadership for doing what you guys do selflessly. There's no, every time I see you guys, it's not like there's never once where it's been a look at me type of deal. You've always pointed towards him and that's something that we're looking for in a church and something that we have found in a church. And I just want to say on behalf of my family, we love you guys. So I wanted to share my testimony, um, where God's taken me, who I am, and all this stuff. Um, so I'll just kind of start at the beginning and work my way to where I'm at now. Um, so I was born in Oklahoma. Um, came from a normal family, divorced and separated and stuff like that. I always like to joke and say that that's the American family. Uh, sadly, that's kind of the way it's, it's pointing to. I think I read a statistic that said 17.8% um, of households have a married mom and dad in the household. And that's today, 17%. So I looked at my wife and I said, hey, we're part of the 17%. How about that? And I think in the 50s, it was like 40% or something like that. So there's just a rapid decline and attack on families and together and the way God meant it to be. But praise God I get to do this with my wife. Um, I'm just really super grateful for that. So I moved to South Dakota in about second grade. And I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, um, as some would call them, the Frozen Chosen. Um, <laughs> And I always thought that was funny because I didn't, I always heard people in the church say, oh yeah, we're the frozen chosen, and I kind of never really got it until I went to like a Pentecostal church or, or somewhere else, you know, it's just kind of sit up, stand up, worship, very minimal moving, so I thought that was always funny, and I was the, I was the kind of kid that went every Wednesday, my dad was in, in the, one of the youth leaders, so I didn't miss a Wednesday, and I never missed a Sunday, um, that was kind of a staple growing up in my life that... We go to church. It doesn't matter. I mean, we live in South Dakota, and it snowed a whole bunch, and we were always there shoveling, opening the doors, all that kind of stuff. So I had a really good example on what was expected. Um, and really, as I went on in my life, I realized that that was what was expected out of my dad. And, um, and I was just going to church because it was what I thought I needed to do. And um, just going to church because it's what I knew. And I knew if I went to church that God wouldn't be mad at me. And then maybe he would look my way during the week and as something good that I did. And it got to the point to where, um, you know, I was doing the church every Sunday and Wednesday, and I would be a church camp counselor as well. Um, and it got to the point where that's all I was doing was just church programs and church functions and stuff like that, and to the point to where I was leading high school kids in Bible studies and stuff like that, and I was like a freshman in high school. So 
I knew a lot about the Lord. I knew a lot about him. I had a lot of knowledge about him. Um, so as growing up, I got baptized, um, my choice, as a junior in high school. I didn't, my mom and dad didn't want to put it on me when I was a little kid, and I didn't understand and everything like that. They wanted to wait until I made the choice, and made the choice. I got baptized and graduated high school, and I didn't know what to do with my life because my brother went to college, and all he did was party and acquired a big amount of student debt, and he was miserable and dropped out. And I knew me, and I knew what I was into, and I knew that, and I had a scholarship for wrestling and for soccer and stuff like that, so the opportunity was there, but I just didn't feel. At the time, I told my parents, I don't feel like that's what God wants me to do. And uh, what that was was a selfish motive, because what I wanted to do was go move out on my own and have my, you know, my parents were kind of strict. I didn't get to stay up past 1030 and didn't get to watch the movies I wanted to or go where I wanted to and stuff like that. But um, raising my kids, I'm not going to be, um, my parents did a wonderful job, by the way. I don't want to talk bad about them. But um, I wanted to experience all the freedom because I never got that freedom when I was little. You know, I had to, it was strict and I had to go to church and I had to do what I had to do. Um, so when I graduated, I started to, I started to live my life for me. And I started to do what I wanted to do. And the day that I realized that I could stay up past 1030 and nobody would care was a humongous revelation to me. <laughs> I remember it was silly because it was like four months after I moved out and I was living with my friend and I'm like, well, it's 1030, I better start heading to bed. And he was like, why? And I was like, you're right. I'm, I can stay up. I can do this. I can really actually do whatever I want. And um, that seed that was planted in me was bad. You know, I can do whatever I want to do. And the funny thing was is I still knew a lot about God and I would still try to witness to people. And I moved to a place called Sioux Falls, and it was the biggest city in South Dakota. And God's always given me um, favor with people. Um, when I go into a new territory, um, even back then, I would just get connected with, I don't know how to really word it, but like people who were a big deal, or people who had connections, or people who were well-known and stuff like that. And I was just always able to to get in with these groups of people. And in high school, I was with the jocks and the nerds and the drama people and the band people. I was just, I was just in with them because I just, I get people and I can understand them. And that was something that God gave me that I could use. And I ended up using that for myself. And pretty soon in Sioux Falls, I became a guy who you wanted to know if you wanted to go and have a good time. Cause I could get it, I could get it all. I mean, if anywhere from steroids to stolen goods or whatever. And I started to, I started to live that life, and it became very easy for me. Uh, my friends would come and say, hey, can you get this? And yes, I can. And then I'd add my tax on it, and that's how I started making money. And my dad called me, and he says, how you doing? Haven't heard from you in about six months. And I realized that it had been that long since I talked to my father, which is not a good thing to do uh, to your parents. He said, so what are you doing? I said, I'm just living with my friends. Okay, but what are you doing? I'm just hanging out. So you're living with your friends? Yeah. Well, how much is your rent? Uh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I was like, well, Dad, honestly, I really don't pay rent. What do you mean you don't pay rent? Where do you work? Well, I don't have a job. What do you mean you don't have a job? Your friends just let you live there? It's like, yeah, Dad, you know me. So you're dealing drugs? <laughs> no, Dad, not me. It's just, I'm just getting by, you know, and that's, kind of where I started to see that I had to answer to my parents when they called. So I went and got like a job at JC Penney's and did the bare minimum just to look like it, even though I had ten, twenty thousand $20,000 in cash with me at all times. Um, and that got to be where I would wake up and, you know, I had a girlfriend, had another girlfriend, had another girlfriend, had tons of friends. But when I woke up, I was alone. And it was, I just couldn't understand why I felt the way I felt, being alone. And I said, man, maybe I need to, maybe I need to start going back to church again. So I um, went to like a Lutheran church, went to another Presbyterian church. And at this point, um, you know, I look scrubby now. I got like the, the beard and the hair, but then it was dreadlocks. And the dreadlocks were down to here, and they were gorgeous. 
Absolutely beautiful. I loved, I loved having dreadlocks. I don't know. I thought it would be easier to maintain, but the dreadlocks are just nasty and nasty. That's what they are. <laughs> they, take, they take way more work than normal hair, that's for sure. Um, but I found myself uh, church hopping, and I would just go from church to church to church to church, and every time I'd have a problem with this church, because why? They didn't talk to me. They didn't look at me. They didn't wave at me. They didn't come shake my hand. They didn't ask me how I was doing. They didn't ask me my name, where I was from, none of that stuff. And every time I'd be mad when I left that church. And later I got to thinking about it and like through working with God and I was going to church for me, you know. I was, they didn't talk to you, so what? Talk to them. That's what God called us to do. God called us to love the people. So I'm going through that in my life and I'm feeling just, hopeless just just this absence of from of, from god of thinking like because i outwardly i had a success successful life you know i had money i had friends and i had all that kind of stuff and uh i remember one time i went to a church and um it was kind of moment of silence and everybody was praying and then all of a sudden you hear it was kind of off topic but this is what happened when i'd go to a church um i heard this little kid go Ew, what's wrong with that guy's hair? And it was just like completely silent in this whole auditorium. And it was a pretty big church, and I was sitting in the back because I came late and left early, you know. They didn't really like me, but I came, came late and left early. How about that? Um, but throughout that church, after he said amen or whatever, you just see some of these. And like every single person in that church noticed me. Not one person came and said hi. Which still hurts my feelings, but what, like, what for? You know, I should have been the one to go over there and do that kind of stuff. But that's what I like about this church. You guys go out of your way to make people feel loved and welcomed, and that's an absolute key in this thing we call church. Um, so in South Dakota, I started doing my thing, um, feeling hopeless, and I said something's got to change. And my friend got a DUI. One of my best friends in high school. And we lived together, and he said, hey, man, I got another DUI. This was the second one in a short amount of time. And he says, I got to join the military. And I was like, okay. And he says, well, when I get all set up, I'll give you a call. Because me and my friend used to be one and two. Where he went, I went. And where he lived, I lived. Or where I lived, he lived. That type of deal. So but a little bit later, he moves to South Carolina. He gives me a call, and he says, hey, buddy, um, I'm all set up. I've got a girlfriend. She's really wealthy, and she has a house, and there's a room. You want to be here for free? So he paid my way down there, and um, I thought it was time for a change. I thought it was really time to stop dealing, stop going to clubs, stop um, just overall just stop being an, like a nasty individual. You know, I wasn't like I wasn't that kind of guy that was like ripping people off. I'd be the type of guy that would hand you your drugs and still have my Bible sitting on the table because I thought that I was ministering to that person. Thank you that Jesus doesn't see that when he looks at me. So I moved to South Carolina, and um, that was definitely a big change for me. Um, grew up in, when I grew up in South Dakota, you know, we didn't have any, there wasn't really different colors of people. So when I showed up at J.C. Penney's, and that's where I just, that's what I knew, so that's where I got a job, and I was the only white guy on my whole entire team, which was hilarious. Um, they always like to give me crap about it, and then like no white people would come into the store until about noon, and then when they would, they'd say, okay, Jesse, or they used to call me hippie, but they'd call me hippie or shaggy, either way, but they'd be like, here you go, shaggy, there's your guys, and then I'd go help the white people, which was really kind of funny, but throughout my life, I, I really haven't seen, like I always joke around, and um, I say, I, I can't be racist because my family's brown. I have brown kids, like, come on, seriously? Um, but I really don't see in color, and I, I wish uh, the world wouldn't see in color any, either. It's just absolutely nuts. So living in South Carolina, not much has changed other than I don't have the connections that I had, um, and I wanted to make a brand new start. And when I got down there, it was a whole different world for me. So I said, oh, I'll find a church when I get my feet planted. And, and pretty soon I'm, I'm doing the same thing I was doing in South Dakota except it's a lot more dangerous down there because like South Dakota, you can have a decent amount of money and your friends would know about it and it'd be okay and you wouldn't get robbed or shot. But in South Carolina, it was a little different. So I decided to get out of that game and just work. 
at a low-paying job because I couldn't pass a drug test. Just still living for myself. Can you believe that? People will struggle, and they will stay in their struggle, even when they're struggling. Why am I struggling? And they're still doing the same thing. It's just, I did that for years, years and years and years. And one of those things when they said, I I wish I knew then what I knew now, like that one, that saying is definitely hard-hitting. Um, so I got with, got with a girl down there that would be um, Ava's mom, and um, I moved to Oklahoma because I wanted to change again, and I thought, you know, in Oklahoma the grass is greener, and that's where I was born because the grass in South Carolina is not as green as it was in South Dakota. So I thought moving to Oklahoma would be a good deal, and I went ahead of my girlfriend, and then she calls me and says, hey, I'm pregnant. Oh, shoot. <laughs> that, that, that makes a wrench in the plan. So I called my mom and said, I don't know what to do. My girlfriend's in South Carolina. I'm in Oklahoma, and I'm having a baby. And she says, well, we'll figure it out. And then a week later, my mom calls me and says, guess what? Your brother's having a baby as well. And so she got to find out within two weeks that she's having her first grandchildren, which was really fun. Um, then my brother called me, and he said, hey, why don't you come back to South Dakota? He said, you're not doing anything in Oklahoma. He's like, and my brother was always really mean to me growing up. I was, a, I was the youngest brother, and he was the biggest brother. And like I said, I have favor with people, so I had favor with his friends. And his friends liked to hang out with me, and that just wasn't okay with him because I was cooler than his friends, per se. But we all know I'm, you're never cooler than your older brother, really. So I don't know what he was all worried about. But me and my brother never really had the best relationship. Um, we do now, praise God. But he said, uh, why don't you come down, come move to South Dakota, and we'll have our kids together, and we'll, we'll raise babies, you know? We'll just be brothers, and I got a good job for you down here. Um, can you pass a drug test? Eh, not yet, but it should take me a little bit to get there, so maybe I can pass one when I get there. So I move me and Ava's mom down to South Dakota, and I start living with my parents, and I quit doing drugs long enough to pass this drug test, and... It was always a really funny joke between me and my friends because they were I was getting a job and drugs were a really big part of my life and a, you know my a big part of my friend's life because that's who I chose to hang out with was the people that did the same things that I did. And I would always joke and they said, "Hey, are you studying for your drug test?" And that's just another way to say, "Are you staying sober?" Basically. So it's like oh, I got a drug t- drug test coming up. Well, did you study? Yeah, I studied. Okay, then you should pass. Um, passed my drug test long enough, long, st- stayed sober long enough to pass my drug test, and then went right back into what I was doing, even though I was working at a manufacturing job, and if you get hurt there, you get drug tested, then you lose your job, so I was taking a really big gamble because it was time to be a dad, and it was time to do those dad things. When you get a house, and a good job, and a car, and then you start to have kids, and I needed to gear my life towards that, but I just... I just couldn't see past myself and what I wanted, even in the midst of having a brand new family. Like it says, sin breeds death, and it was death to my relationship um, with Ava's mom, with anybody, with my mom and dad, with my brother. I couldn't hold a good relationship with them because I was so busy with myself. Long story short, with Ava's mom, it wasn't working out. Um, We were both living in sin. We were both um, just wanting to be us. And long story short, she ends up taking Ava away from me, um, assaulting me and taking Ava away from me within eight hours. Um, Assaulted me, didn't want to call the police because I didn't want anything to happen. Woke up the next morning and she was nowhere. Nowhere to be seen. And then she ended up getting back to South Carolina in a very short amount of time. And during that time, I didn't see Ava for 11 months straight. Just ruined me. I was absolutely devastated, but I couldn't do anything, called the police, all that kind of stuff. It was mom has all the power, and mom's in South Carolina, that's where mom's going to be. And if I wanted my daughter, I'd have to move down there. That's basically the way that it was coined to me. And um, I didn't want to at all. But I really wanted my daughter. Um, So I just tried to do what I knew how to do, and that was work, and try to save money to get a lawyer and stuff like that. So I continued to work at Terex, even though I was absolutely separated, just broken, because I didn't have Ava, and I didn't know what to do. 
and I still wasn't searching for the Lord at all. I was still, and then that's when um, alcohol became a really big part of my life. And in South Dakota, um, you know, people here or people around, they joke, when we meet, we eat. But in South Dakota, it was when we meet, we drink. And then eating might soak up the drinking, so we're going to hold back off on that. Um, So alcohol was a really big staple in my life um, at that point. And um, the drugs just increased as well. And I remember I worked the night shift and my brother worked the day shift at this company. So I would see him when I get off work. He would pull up in his forklift. How was, how was your day? Blah, blah, blah. And we were staying in there. And then in walks this lady. And she has these, if, at, our, at our work, if you're really cool, you had these mirrored safety glasses. So that way people couldn't see where you were looking or anything like that. It was just a psychological thing, but she had these mirrored sunglasses and she had this water bottle and she had this walk that, like, she just owned the place. And I looked over at my brother and I said, wow. I was like, she works here? And then he looked at me and he beeped his horn on his forklift and he said, good luck, buddy, and he, he took off. And that lady was Cindy. get so blessed with that lady. It's nuts. So I really liked her. I looked at her and I thought she was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And she's hardworking. I mean, she's a welder. How, how many people do you know that's a female welder? I just, she's here with me and she's going to be working hard. I was just like, I can get on board with that. And I said, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to try to say hello. Um... But she actually came and said hello to me first, so we argue about that one sometimes, but she, she said hi to me first. Um, but I was on these things called tip events. I, I wanted to try to get out of work when I was at work. I just, I was. I'd be the president of the safety committee. I'd be on these events, anything to pull me out of work. And I went to this thing called the tip event where you make sure that people, basically how to get people to work more efficiently, which I can, I can, I can see. <laughs> work more efficiently, but me actually putting that into practice was a whole different thing. So it really sounds funny. Like in my job now, I'm a project manager for a company, and I have to work with masons and stuff like this. So logistically, I can put it together in my head, and then this is what we need to do to get the job done. But doing it myself is a whole different thing. So praise God that he, he put me where I'm at. Um, but I started to do a tip event in Cindy's area, and um, she started coming and talking to me. And she would start talking about the Lord. Remember, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, so I know I know what I'm talking about, big time. <laughs> so I knew all the right things to say. I definitely knew all the right things to say. And um, like I always say, every time I share those testimonies, I tricked my wife into thinking I was a really cool dude. Yeah, because every time she wanted to talk about the Bible, I knew about it, and I'd show her these goosebumps on my arm that were coming up, so you knew I was really spiritual. And uh, she'd start talking about her church and stuff like this, and then um, she broke up with her boyfriend, and I was like, here's my chance, I'm going to go for it. And I asked her um, if she wanted to go to the state fair, which was a big deal in our town, and she, I was like, there's a rodeo coming up. And she's like, oh, I don't know. I have my kids. And at this point, I didn't have Ava. So I'm longing to, you know, whoa, you got kids? Let's go. Let's do it. I'll be dad. I'll take all your kids to the rodeo. She's like, oh, I'll think about it. Maybe. And then to me, I'm like, maybe. Excuse me? Like, do you, do you know who I am? Maybe. Yeah, right, maybe. So I went home that night, and um, the rodeo was starting, and I get a text from Cindy, and she says, where are you at? Home. Why are you at home? I thought we were going to the rodeo. I was just like, maybe. <laughs> so she blew me off. I blew her off, but um, we ended up talking on the phone and started to really build a relationship that was something special. Um, and she was going to church, so... Um, she was going to a really good church, and we'll get into that. So she was, uh, she was doing things the way I didn't want things to go when we started dating. Because normally when I started dating a girl, um, she would move in with me, or I'd move in with her. And we would spend all day and all night together, 
and you know we'd be living in sin. We'd be doing stuff that you shouldn't do until you're married. Um, and she just wasn't having that with me. And I've never been in a relationship where the girl wasn't having that. You know, like you want to live with me? I'm a funny guy. I clean up. I do all. You know, I'm I'm a good guy to live with. And she kept saying, I just don't feel right about it, and it's just not what God wants us to do, and all this stuff. And I just got sick of it one day, and I was thinking about it. It's like, what am I doing? I was like, I think I was 24 at the time, 25, 26. And I thought I was old. And I was just like, it's like, man, I got to get married. I got to get this one. I'm like, she has two kids. They don't have dads. I want to be a dad. She's a hard worker. She's beautiful. She's funny. Why not? Who says we can't? So about a month and a half after dating her, um, I took her to a concert. Um, A guy that I kind of grew up with in South Dakota, Sioux Falls, um, he made it pretty big. He was on like MTV and stuff like that. And I was just joke around when they asked me how I knew Nick. And I was just like, I was his drug dealer. And then people would laugh and then they would never know that I was serious. But um, I got to go to this concert and I said, hey, Nick, I got my girlfriend here. I want to propose to her at your concert. And he was like, I would love that. And then I asked him to play a song. And after that, he said, hey, guys. And this is like, you know, four or 500 people out in this concert. And we're just out there. And he stops the whole concert. And he says, and my friend Jesse has something. He really wants to get off his chest. Jesse, you want to come up here real quick? And I leave Cindy. And I go up there. And I tell her how, how awesome this lady is that I've been dating. And that I love her. And I want her to be my wife in front of everybody. That's why I am the pro- a declaration, everybody. This is who I love. Which I should have known Cindy a little more. She is def- she, she is definitely not that type of person. Um, I always joke around every time I preach, she seems to be out of town, or she has something to do, which she's not here, so it's kind of funny. Um, she almost didn't go up there, so, but she did. She went up there, and I got down on one knee, and I proposed to her, and um, after that, I said, when can I move in? You know, hey, we're getting married, right? What's up? When can I move in? She still said no. Still said no. So I fixed that real fast. Uh, I was like, well, a month and a half later, we got married. So we went to the courthouse and we just did it because I was like, why are we planning this? Like, we got, you know, I don't want to wait till summer to marry you and to be with you and to live with you. Let's just go do it. So we did. We went to the courthouse. And I always joke because I always say I loved her more because I was the only one to cry at the wedding. And the lady was like, it's so nice to see courthouse weddings where, where they're just so in, so in love. And I was like, can we not call it a courthouse wedding? Can we just call it my wedding? <laughs> my, my brother showed up in sweatpants and he was my witness. And he was like, I didn't know this was a, a dress up thing. And I'm like... I was like, "All right, when you get married, I'll be in I'll be in some Walmart pajamas and some bunny slippers and tell you I didn't know it was a dress-up thing." So we we went ahead and got hitched and I was just absolutely excited and um we got married and we lived together and we we found a house out in the country that was just absolutely a blessing. We paid $300 a month for five or one acre, a pond, five bedrooms. Um, 300 that's it, utilities, water, all that kind of stuff, for $300. I'm like, wow, this is what happens when you marry a blessed woman. I was like, this is the way my life's going to go. And um, she got pregnant shortly after um, we got married, and then Shiloh was born. And we realized that most of our paychecks were going to a babysitter. Um, like one of all of our paychecks, because when you got like four kids and a babysitter, that gets to be a lot of money. So like, I'm like, I'm only keeping $500 of my money a month. I was like, something's got to give. And Cindy said, well, one of us could stay home. And I was like, that's a good idea. You should do that. And she's like, I make more money than you. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that is absolutely true you do. And um, I, have, I have a really good patience for kids and understanding and stuff like that. So it was obvious that it was going to be my job to be a stay-at-home dad. And that didn't go very well with her family. Uh, her family's Hispanic, obviously, and the man makes the money, and the man does this, and the man does that, and you're going to let him stay home and take all your money and do what? 
So that was a really, not even a really big struggle because I shut that down right away because this is, this is my family, you know. I'm taking care of this family, and so is my wife. And throughout that time, um, when I started to stay home, I started to get this panicked feeling in me that how are we going to provide for this family? $300 a month, and I was worried about how we're going to provide for this family. Um, so the devil made it really easy. I got back in, in touch with some of my other friends and said I was staying home, and they said, well, what are you going to do for money? And you, you can't make it, and there's all these people that are telling me that I won't be able to do it. So I got back into drug dealing. Um, and I considered it low key at that point um, because I wasn't, I was just, in my head, it was just weed, you know, and, um, and who's it gonna hurt? So get this picture, I'm a stay at home dad with four kids and I'm dealing pounds of weed out of my house and I don't think that it's a problem. You know what I mean? How blind was this man right here? absolutely crazy that I put my, my family at risk, my wife at risk, my house at risk, everything at risk for what, like $10,000 every month? It's just nuts. I remember I used to, to hide it. I'd vacuum seal it and hide it, and I'd vacuum seal and hide my money, like Cindy could smell the money or something like that. Um, and I'd put it under this dresser, and we were sitting in the room on a Saturday, and Cindy's like, Let's rearrange the room. What do you think? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it. She's like, let's move these two dressers over here. Okay, I'll do that when you go to work, because that's where all my, my, my hiding spot was. You know, I can't have my wife pick up this and see, you know, what is she going to do if she sees thousands of dollars there? Long story short, she found out I was drug dealing. And like I said, I tricked her into thinking I was a cool guy, and I was very sneaky about it. So she would go to bed, and then my friends would come over, and then my customers would come over, and then they were gone by morning, and then I put my kids on the bus and take care of the other ones on little sleep, and she had no idea. In that moment that she found all that stuff, it was a, it's a pretty bad day. Um, so she started to realize that what I was doing with my time and how I was spending it and where all this extra money was coming from and everything. And she knew I was like a hustler, so like I'd do like eBay and you know I'd sell shirts and watches, and that's where I told her where all the money was coming from, and she just thought that was really successful. Um, so she was during this time she was taking all four of our kids to her church, and I wasn't going to this church. Um, I would just you know party, and she wouldn't say anything. She'd pick up the kids and she'd go to church, and. Um, and then she just got sick of it. And I love this about my wife, is when she gets sick of it, she puts her foot down, and um, she has this way of talking to me where I want to do what she's saying. So she says, I want you to go to church with me. I said, why don't we, yeah, well, I'll go to church with you, but let's just go to my Presbyterian church, because I'm going to this big, ornate Presbyterian church all my life, and that's what I know. And I said, besides that, your church is like two hours long. And my church, we're in and out in 45 minutes. Like, we're boom, boom, lunch, home, do what we want. She says, no, you're coming to my church. And her church was this YWCA. So it's like a YMCA, but it's a YWCA. And it was literally right across the street from my Presbyterian church. And my Presbyterian church has the copper dome and just big and beautiful. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just angry. I'm so angry. Why are you taking me into this church that's two hours long and hallelujah and they raise their hands and I, you don't need all that stuff. You don't need all this show. I was like, let's just go to the Presbyterian church. And she says, you can, you can do what you want, but I want you to go to my church. But you can do what you want. Me and the kids are going in. So I kind of sat in the car and fought myself for a little bit. And I said, there's really no reason why I, like, I shouldn't be going into this church with my wife. And when I walked into this church, it was different. It was, it was wild. Let me pull up my notes real quick. It was, it was wild because I started to um, instantly, I wanted to cry. And I didn't know why. Just, just that feeling, it just, I just got overwhelmed. And I looked around at these people, and they were worshiping. And they were expecting something. I could just feel it. 
when I walked in and I saw these people, I just heard God tell me that they're expecting something. And I was like, expecting what? And um, I didn't see it as like, you know, oh, and like, you know, some of the Pentecostal meetings and people running up and down the aisles and falling down and stuff like that. And I went to a Pentecostal church when I'd go visit my grandma and this is not like, it's not like what I thought it was, you know. And that wasn't happening in that church, but uh, God blesses the stuff when it does happen that way. And um, this worship was just so real that I, I couldn't get it out of my head. And then this pastor gets up, and my wife kind of elbows me and says, that's Pastor Jeff. And I've heard a lot about this guy because their friends talk really highly of him, and he's super great and all this stuff. And he gets up and he starts preaching, and he says... Uh, and you know, like when you hear a message and you, you feel like the person's just talking directly at you the whole entire time. It's just like, geez, man. Like I was thinking my wife got up with this guy and she was like, my husband's going to come. I know he's going to come and you got to preach this and you got you to gotta really single him out. And I was kind of getting mad in my head about it. And that's the Holy Spirit. If you feel like somebody's talking directly to you, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. Um, and he said... And he said it really seriously, too. He's like, do you want to be a great man of God? And I kind of was just like, shoot, I am a great man of God. And, you know, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church. Church camp counselor, hey. Um, and I said, shoot, I am a great man of God. Because that was the state of my heart. You know what I mean? That was who I thought I was. But I wasn't. He says, you want to be a great man of God? It's really easy. you got to do two things. Read your Bible every day. And pray every day shoot that's easy I'll do it and I kind of looked at my wife and I was like bet I was like I'm gonna do it and um and I was a stay-at-home dad too and my wife was mad at me and I just knew that I was always gonna and then I you know I'd I'd, I'd hear the still small voice always talking to me and I never knew you know I always thought you know there's three voices there's God you and the devil. And I never, I just always chalked it up to me, having bad thoughts or good thoughts or whatever. So I decided to go for it. And I started reading the Bible. But he told me when you start reading the Bible, he says, he says, do it differently than just you, you read a normal book. He said, he said, get alone away so nobody can see you. Not your kids, not your wife, not nobody. Just you. And that's what I mean by reading the Bible. And he said, close your eyes. And ask God, show me. That's it. Show me. Then I started to, to pray that. And when I started to read the Bible, I just started to get these revelations. And the Word became alive. You know, you hear that? The Word's alive. And it is, too. And it, it started to speak to me in a way that I've never known before. And I started in... Uh, like Matthew, and I just started going and reading the New Testament, and I started burning through the Bible, and my wife shares a story. She'd get home, and I'd be on this one chair, and I had been reading the Bible all day. And I was just so hungry for the Word that I couldn't put it down. And I always tell Jeff that he tricked me. And I was like, that's such a trick. Read the Bible and pray, but once you start doing that, you develop a relationship with the Lord that is unbreakable. Because I was setting appointments with God, and I was keeping them. And he absolutely loves that about my relationship with him. And I know at 6.05 in the morning, he is waiting there, and he is rubbing his hands, and he is moving back and forth, because he knows in just a couple more minutes, we can, we can be together. And he feels that way about us, where he says... You set a time to meet with me, I'm there. And he doesn't disappoint. And then um, I got this feeling that I should ask Pastor Jeff, what's a good book of the Bible? Next time you see him on Sunday, God said, and I knew God's voice now. It wasn't a, it wasn't a still small voice anymore. It was the voice in my head. And it, and it was always speaking to me. And I couldn't understand how come I was missing this my whole life. Because in the Presbyterian Church, we talked about Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But nobody told me that I could have direct access to all of that. 
because I knew a lot about God. But now from this point on, I know him personally. Because you can know all you want about God, but until you know him, it doesn't become real. It doesn't become tangible. There's no power behind it. There's no fire behind it. There's, there's nothing. It's just void if you just know about him. And that was a really big thing that changed in my life because I started to know him personally and have a relationship with him, and I started to just look at him. And he, started, he told me this thing last week. Um, he says, if you love me, you'll look at me. And you know that if we glance in his direction, we ravish his heart. And that got me so excited because I have the ability to ravish the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the lover of my soul. I have a chance to do that when I just stop and I look at him and I say, I love you. There's no one like you, Jesus. I magnify your name, Jesus, above everything in my life today. I just worship you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords and lover of my soul. And I started to take little breaks like that in my life. And it just blew me away. For a while, I was just a sobbing mess because I just didn't know how to handle the presence of God. Because it was just so overwhelming because he loves me. And he's not mad at me. He's not this guy that's up there that's saying, do this and do that. And if you don't do this, I'm going to be mad at you. All he's saying is, love me so that you can love them. And once I, once I heard that and I got to thinking about what Bible, Bible passage that um, Pastor Jeff wanted me to read. Let me get these real quick. So I see Pastor Jeff at church, and it was weird because he walked right up to me, just straight away, because I was going to, in my head, if he wasn't going to come up to me, I really wasn't going to go talk to him. I wasn't going to go out of my way, and he comes right up, and he says, Jess, bud, how's it going? And I said, hey, man, I've been doing uh, what you preached about like a couple weeks ago, read your Bible every day, pray every day, and, I, you know? and he says, good, you're a great man of God then, right? And I said, well, I'm getting there. And I said, uh, is, there, is there a specific book in the Bible you want me to read? Like, what's your favorite? I really want to know what, what you think about a book. And he goes, well, that's cool. He was just like, actually, he's like, you want to read it together? You want to just meet up? I was like, heck yeah. And then after I got done talking, I kind of walked over to my wife and I sat down and guess who has a meeting with the pastor? So that's a big change within a month of her finding out I was a drug dealer. And uh, it was really funny. Uh, a joke that I like to say is um, I used to be one of the biggest drug dealers in South Dakota. And you know that Jesus has changed my heart. Otherwise, I would have said I was the biggest drug dealer in South Dakota. <laughs> so now I prefer the other guys over me, you know, because God's just humbled my heart in such a way that I can, that I can love people and prefer them. My wife always tells me not to tell that joke. <laughs> like, well, I get, I get nervous. I say dumb stuff sometimes. I don't know. So I started meeting up with Jeff. And um, we'd meet at a coffee shop. And I sat down with him. And um, even though I was going through the scriptures and I was praying and everything, um, nothing's really changed outwardly in my life. I was still drinking and I was still smoking pot. Um, but now the difference was I was reading the Bible and I was praying a lot and um, I'd get to this point um, and I was listening to Bethel came out with a new album at the time and it was just wrecking me just absolutely tearing me down just bawling crying as I was drinking beer just funny like to think about my life then sitting in a garage and negative degree weather, smoking cigarettes and drinking beer because my wife doesn't like either of those things and listening to worship music and just crying. And I'd get to a point where I knew that I was just, you know, there's that feeling where it's like, oh, God's going to break through and I'm just, this is going to be great. And it would just be like that. Like I'd hear that in my spirit. 
And then I just couldn't worship anymore. I was just, I didn't feel God's presence anymore. It just left. It, he never leaves you. You're never separate from him. But it, I had a, because I, be, I can be with Rod in the room and not talk to him and not look at him, but we're still together. But man, we're really separate. And that's the way it kind of felt because I, I wanted to push in and I wanted to push in and I wanted to praise him and I wanted to feel his presence. And he was letting me know that I, I really didn't. I mean, if I did, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So when I met up with Jeff, I told him, uh, Jeff, I respect what you do. I think you're a really great man of God. And um, I love the way that you're leading your church. And I thank you for this opportunity that you get to meet with me. <laughs> yeah, that was the state of my heart right there. Um, I said, there's three things about me that I don't plan on ever changing. I smoke weed, I drink beer, and I love Jesus. None of those things are going to change. You know what he did? He went. So Jesse, I want to disciple you, okay? I mean, after I say that to somebody, like, and he he's meeting there to, to get into God with me, and he didn't tell me he didn't tell me nothing. He just was just like, I see you, because he was hearing from the Holy Spirit. And the, and I've always asked him, how come you didn't tell me not to do those things? It's not my place to tell you not to do those things, Jesse. I'm discipling you. My job was to love you and listen to God. And what he says, I say. Um, so it was really cool. I just started, um, when he said that, I want to disciple you. I heard this still small voice that wasn't so small anymore that said, if you say yes to this, and you can say no, and you're not going to hurt this man's feelings, you won't. But if you say yes to this, don't you dare waste this man's time. So I sat there for a minute, and I thought about it, and I weighed my decisions. And I thought, well, reading the Bible's going really good. And my relationship with my wife is pretty much just dumb. You know, we always fight, and everything's not good, and we have so many kids. I was like, I ain't got nothing else left but to try it. So I said yes. And... Um, through working with Jeff and reading the Bible, and he would, you know, we'd set goals. You know, when, when he'd set up with a Bible reading time, a prayer plan time, and then we'd set goals on, um, you know, what what was happening throughout the week. And I kept meeting up with him, and he'd keep me accountable, and he'd teach me um, basically what the gospel was. Because I mean, growing up, he says, "Do you know what the gospel is?" And I said, well, "Yeah, yeah, the gospel, right?" Jesus died, he raised, and he was just like, yeah, but tell me the gospel, you know? And there was just, there wasn't power behind it because I didn't, I didn't know the gospel because I didn't really know and take ownership of what he did. And through that time, um, I woke up one, one night after a night of drinking with my brother because we'd always drink, you know, Friday and Saturday. We meet, we drink. And I woke up and God said, today's the day you're done drinking. And I was like, Okay. And he was like, say it. I was like, I'm done drinking. He says, okay, now call your pastor. <laughs> that means I'm really done drinking because he's going to ask me about it. I mean, and we had the state fair coming up and everything, and there was the beer gardens, and then there was concerts, and my friends were going to come over to my house, and there was all these things in my head. And he said, do you love your wife? You know I do. Do you love your family? You know I do. Do you love me? You know that I do. Then what's the big deal? Just quit. Picked up the phone. I said, hey, Jeff. Just heard from the Lord. I'm done drinking. I need. I heard him drop the phone. And he was just singing in tongues. He was just praising the Lord. But he didn't ask me about the weed. That was the thing. So I quit drinking. But I didn't quit smoking. Um, and God was working on me. You know what I mean? He was working on me. Which was really great of him to do. Thank you, Jesus. When he says he'll never give you more than you can handle. Right? If you're in the will of the Father. I love it. If you're in the will of the Father, he just... He's so gentle. He's so kind. He'll guide you. He'll point you. He'll correct you. So I started, uh, 
I started, I quit drinking and I just felt like my brain was just clear. You know, I just, I had some, I had some change about me. My parents couldn't believe it. Christmas time was coming up and Jesse's not drinking and all this kind of stuff. And um, I started to go on YouTube. Uh, I started to get more and more hungry for the word and for messages and stuff like that. And I, I found this guy named Todd White. Does anybody here know who Todd White is? He is like one of my favorite people. He is so fun. And he had dreadlocks too, so I was like, I can get on board with that guy. And he kind of came from the same thing I did, just drug dealing and stuff like that. Um, and he, I just really liked it. He would just, he would just love people, and he would go and he'd pray for healing, and he'd say that it's possible. And I just couldn't wrap my head around it. And um, there was this thing called Power and Love, and it's a, a really fun thing where they go and they equip you to evangelize. Um, so my wife said, "You want to go to this?" And I said, "No way." And you know, we got I, she works and I don't, and God provided the money, and I went. And um, I started to get in Robbie Dawkins and Todd White, and I started to learn under these guys for a couple of days. And we'd have sessions, and then we'd go out and we'd pray for people. And I started going out, and I'd started laying hands on people, and I'd pray, and I'd pray, and nothing would happen. And this guy would cuss me out, and this guy would yell at me to leave me alone. And I'd try to do a word of knowledge on this person, and it's completely off. And it was just like, what in the world is going on here? I thought that if I came, God would meet me here, and he would show up. Because it's not me doing this stuff, right? When I pray, it's not me. When I say, it's not me, it's you. And if I'm with you, you're with me. And God was just like, I love you. He was just like, but you're just not sincere. It's like, what? And he says, if you love me, you'd follow my commandments. And I knew what he was talking about. So I said, okay, I'm done. I am done. And he says, okay, you know what to do. Picked up the phone. I called Pastor Jeff. It was nuts what happened after this. As soon as I hung up that phone, I saw a guy walking to me like that. And that's what I was looking for, you know, somebody that's hurt. And I stopped him and I said, hey man, what's, uh, what's going on? And he says, oh man, I broke my, my two toes on the side. They've been broken for months. I just can't get them to heal. And I was like, cool. And he was like, not cool. He's like, I'm about to lose my job, buddy. How, what's cool about that? And I was like, well, it's a cool thing you met me today because I'm going to pray for you and you're going to get healed. And I said this a couple times now this week and it didn't work. You know what I mean? But I heard from the Lord and he said I wasn't sincere and if I would just stop living for me and start living for him, I could get some business done. I can get his business done because I was trying to do my agenda. I wanted to pray for people so that they got healed. And if the way my heart was at that time is dangerous because if God would have let me go on like that, it would have been about me. And he knows that. And I can't work for him if I'm living for me. And um, I got down on my knees, and I was just like, I am trusting you, Lord, because this guy is kind of scary. And I put my hands down, and I say the most basic, quick prayer I can. In Jesus' name, your toes are healed. And I snap my fingers like it would make a difference. <laughs> and I got up, and I looked at him, and he's crying. This guy loses it, and his foot got healed. And he said, uh, he said, you don't understand. I was like, oh, now I understand the Lord healed you. No, no, you don't understand what's going on in my life right now. He moved his family down to Georgia, and he started working on this construction site. He broke his two toes. The two toes couldn't get healed, therefore he couldn't work. And his last physical was the day after that. And if he didn't pass that, he was fired. Like he was booked up, he was gone, he moved his family down there and everything. And God gave him a brand new toes. You know what I mean? Like, you, there, it's just so hard to explain because I just want to jump up and down because there is nothing, nothing like that. 
And I got a chance to say that it's him, it's him, it's him. And then people were walking by and they're seeing this guy crying and they're seeing me cheer. So I'm like dancing and this guy's bawling and everybody around us is like, what is going on? And I was like, Jesus, Jesus just healed this man. His toes were broken. Now he can walk and he can provide for his family. And I was just, I was just lit on fire. And then the next day, I went home and I ended up praying for like 55 people on the way from uh, Georgia to South Dakota on an airplane. I'm talking like pre, like the plane lands and I stand up in my seat and I say, guys, guys, sorry to take your time. I just, I just really got something on my chest I got to get out. I just want to tell you two things, that Jesus is alive and he's so real and he loves you so much. If your body hurts, please come and see me. I have so many testimonies of God just healing and delivering people. If you don't know more about this, Jesus, please, I beg you, please come talk to me. I'll show you what he's all about. I won't just tell you because there is power behind him. Oh, man, it was just, I feel him now because he's real and he's tangible and he's electric. And um, I was just changed. I came back and it was just like, these words of knowledge were coming out of me like like nothing. And um, usually when I would, would not, when I would try to give a word of knowledge, I would felt like I had to defend myself after, you know? Does that, you know, does that kind of maybe, you know, maybe make sense or nothing? But it was, it was just on, 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 on. And then um, I got to realize that I just need to trust him. I just need to trust him and I just need to open my mouth and, you know, it'd be something really just absolutely random. I see three cows and uh, a lady with a, a stick up in the air, and she's trying so hard, and she keeps missing these cows, but she can't get them. And then this, this lady's just, like, bawling in front of me. And this means absolutely nothing to me, but it means everything to her. And I just started to realize that I, I get to do that now with my life. I get to love God. And then, in turn, I get to love people. And then out of... Out of that loving God comes obedience. Because if I love him, I will listen to him and I'll do what he says. And it's really fun too because um, like I don't I don't cheat on my wife because it's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? I don't cheat on my wife because I love her. Um, the same thing is with God. I don't go living my life in sin because I like I don't go um, watch pornography because it's it's not the right thing to do. No, I don't watch pornography because I love him. I don't deal drugs because I love him. I get out at the gas station and I go up to that person because he said to. And I just go up to him and I say, how are you today? I'm good. Man, it's a great day, isn't it? Well, I don't know, it's kind of windy. Yeah, but it's the best day ever. We're never going to get one like this, you know? Did you know that you're God's favorite person today? I'm what? You're God's favorite person, man. He loves you so much. Do you know that he's not mad at you? Do you know that he has plans for your life? And then from there, you just get to operate. You know what I mean? You get to, you get to see, you get to talk, you get to relate with these people. And that's why we have the best job ever. It was funny, um, my friends would always say, it's because you're an evangelist. And it's just like, everybody's an evangelist, in my opinion, because God said, go. He said, go and make disciples. Why would he say that? He didn't say, evangelist, go and just do this. And teachers, you go and do this. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there's giftings and everything like that. But that's what makes us all function. We all have evangelism in us. And it's just going and telling. Let me see where I'm at in my notes. Let's see. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, so... I went, um, I, started, I started getting really, really, really hungry um, for seeing um, God move, like big time. So I, I started saying, I wanted to go to this Israel trip um, with like Todd White, Daniel Kalinda, and all these other people, see the Holy Land with all these big names. And I thought that was really great and I couldn't afford it. Um, so I ended up going to uh, the School of Evangelism is what it's called. Does anybody here know who Reinhard Bonnke is? I went to his school of evangelism and it wrecked me, changed me, marked me, sent me out. 
it's really funny when uh, I see pictures of like inaugurations and uh, big football crowds and stuff like that. If you go ahead and Google Reinhard Bonnke and see that they had a million people come to the Lord in one meeting, like in one weekend meeting, and you see just a sea of people hungry for the gospel. I was like, sign me up. So I went to this Reinhard Bonnke School of Evangelism, and I got to sit with all the big names and learn under Todd White and Michael Koulianos and Eric Gilmore and all these like really big people. And something absolutely incredible happened. And it's School of Evangelism, SOE, and we called it SOE 17, and they still talk about what happened that week because we couldn't really get any teaching done because um, it was just basically a school of spirit. Um, a teacher would get up and they would start to speak and they wouldn't get five minutes into it and they couldn't say a word. And it was just, you just knew how it happened. It was just cry here, cry there, laugh here, fall there, and it was just done. Absolutely done. And, um, and it was like a real good networking thing too. I met a lot of people from around the world here and I learned, a, and they really spurred me on and, and made me um, more excited that I wasn't doing this by myself because in South Dakota, it wasn't really too many radical people and there was, but really it's not radical. We're just doing what he said to do. And if we don't go out and do these things, then we're in the way. We are, in my opinion, what I say to myself is I am not bigger than God. And when he tells me to get out and go do something, I need to go do it because his ways are not my ways. His ways are more important. Just like if I wouldn't have prayed for that guy, maybe God would have sent somebody else and his, his feet would have got healed, but he would have lost his job or whatever, you know, so I need to be obedient. And uh, really fun testimony. Uh, I had to go to the airport super early in the morning in Florida and they don't turn the terminals on until like 4.30 or something like that. So there's all these lines and lines of people. And I had such an amazing week with God, seeing people healed, delivered, set free. Just, I saw a guy's uh, broken leg, we were praying for him, and uh, his toe was pointing all the way in this way. And we prayed, nothing happened, prayed, nothing happened. And my friend got a word from the Lord that you're going to get up and walk. And we started walking it out, and you could hear the cracks in his bone until his feet were straight. And he ended up taking off running. So that was a good testimony, the short version of it. Um, but I, that's just a little of what was going on in Florida. And then I'm really kind of tired. I have my headphones in, and I'm thinking, I'm done, man. I'm, I've prayed for enough people. I just want to, I just want to relax. And um, and there's so many people around me. And then I asked the person, uh, "What's up with that line?" And there was nobody in that line. And they're like, "Well, I don't know. I didn't even see it was open." And then one person gets in there, and I'm like way at the back of a line. So I'm like, thanks, Lord. Boom, you always have a place for me. And I was second in line on the terminals, which was really super great. And uh, the lady in front of me kind of looked at me, and I was just like, hey, praise God, huh? We did it. You're first. Good job. She was like, leave me alone. I was like, oh, okay. Because I was, I'm the type of guy that just start up a conversation. And um, then people started trucking in behind me or whatever. And um, I hear the Lord say, um, the terminal opens at like 4.30. He said, at 4.35, I want you to stand up where they weigh their bags, and I want you to preach the gospel. <sighs> I've done that. I can do that, right? I've done that. I can do that. But I haven't done that to 4.30 in the morning, grumpy people waiting at a terminal, uh, just fighting each other and all that kind of stuff. And he says, do it and watch me move. Yes. Yes, Lord. And then I told the lady again, I said, hey, sorry to bother you. I'm not cutting in front of you. Um, I'm just going to stand up. And it sounds crazy, I know. I just want to stand up there and I just want to tell these people something. She was like, leave me alone. It's like, yes, ma'am. So the time came and uh, he kind of told me like 30 minutes earlier. So I was kind of like, why can't I do it now? You know, why can't I kind of get up there and get it over with? And I waited on the Lord in five minutes, too. I stood up there, and I just basically said the same thing I always say. You know, I just said, hey, everybody, sorry to take your time. All these people look up at me angry. I don't work for the airport. I just want to let you know that I had this feeling in my heart. Um, if you have sickness in your body, the Lord will heal you today. And he is real, and he's alive, and he's tangible. And if you need prayer, please, I don't care if I miss my flight, I'll pray for you. And um, I get done, and I say, thank you for your time. And everybody goes back to what they're doing. And this one guy is like psh, 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 clapping and everything. And it happens to be the guy that's directly behind me in line. 
And uh, I get down, and he was just like, wow, man, I've heard of stuff like that before. I've just never seen somebody do it. Wow. Wow, oh, honey, can you believe? Wow. And he's just like, he just, he's just taken back that somebody would get up and just proclaim the name of Jesus. Um, and I said, all right, buddy, what hurts in you? Is it your hip? Your hip, right? And he was just like, yeah. And it's that, that thing, you know, when you know, you know, it's your hip. I just know it's your hip. And I said, cool, man, let me see it. Boom, I put my hand on his hip. I said, in the name of Jesus, sciatica, nerve pain, everything, cartilage, boom, made perfect, whole in the name of Jesus. And then he's like, he goes like that, and then stands up really straight again. And he looks over at his wife, and his wife starts crying. And then he starts crying. And they, I guess they went to Disney World, and he had to sit down every five minutes, and they're with their granddaughter, and they didn't know how many trips they'd get with her. And, and it just kind of ruined the trip, and he was really mad, and he was really angry, and God just took it away from him like that. And I said, praise God, and then I prayed for a different lady, and she got healed, and I prayed for a different guy, and he just got, he just got really touched by God, by a word of, that he needed from the Lord. And I got back in line, and the guy taps me on the shoulder, the one that got his hip healed, and he goes, he goes, what about arthritis? And he goes like that, and then I just covered my hands on his, and I said, God healed your leg. Do you believe that he can heal your hands? He goes, yes. And I said, be healed, and I let go. I mean, this guy was going like this, like it was so cool. And it was all because I was directly obedient to what the Lord had to tell me to do when he told me to do it, you know? And I get to be, and how many people, how many people there do you think he told to get up and preach the gospel? I mean, it couldn't have been just me, because if I don't do it, somebody will. And the gospel needed to get preached there. And I was just so blessed that I get to be used by God in this atmosphere. And um, I get to my flight and it says, delayed, delayed, go see the flight attendant. And I could see all these people on standby and my seat didn't have a ticket number on it. And we all know if you're in an airport and your seat doesn't have a ticket number, that ain't necessarily a good thing. You're probably getting bumped from your flight. And I'd been away from my family at the School of Evangelism and I didn't care. I said, praise God, if, you, if I miss my flight, I get to pray for more people. So. Good luck. Like, good luck, devil. Like, you're not going to really steal this from me. And I get up there, and I hand the lady my ticket, and it says, and everybody else is mad. She's mad. They're mad. Everybody's mad. And I'm walking on roses and butterflies and daisies because I know who I am. I know where I'm going, and I know how he feels about me. And nothing can change that. And I said, your nails are so pretty. She's like, oh, thank you. And I was like, they really are. Wow. And you probably keep them nice because that's the thing people see and everything. You do a really good job here. I really appreciate you. It looks like a rough day, huh? And she goes, yeah, it is a pretty rough day. And I'm like, all these people mad at you? And she's like, yeah, most of them. And I was like, I won't be mad at you. Don't worry. And then she was like, and hands me my ticket. And she said, I upgraded you to first class. I got to see a reward immediately, you know what I mean? And I saw this flight attendant lady standing there crying. And obviously me, I go up and I said, what's wrong? I've, I went here on vacation and I've been on standby for two days and I just can't get on this plane. And then the Lord told me, give her your ticket. This is a first class ticket. I don't, I've never really been in first class before. And plus I'd preached the gospel and I was obedient and you gave me my reward right away and now you're going to ask me to give it up? What is going on here? And I said, and I put my ticket in her hand and I said, ma'am, I want to give you this. I want to give you my ticket. And she says, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. It's my ticket. I can do what I want with it. And she's like, no, but it has your name on it. And I was like, so I can go up there and change it and she'll give it to you? And she says, no, she probably won't because it's against airline policy and everything like that. Long story short, I couldn't give her my ticket. And I really tried to give her my ticket, but the Lord knew that I couldn't give her my ticket. But he wanted to see what I would do with it. Am I responsible with what he gives me as a reward? Absolutely, because it's not mine, it's yours, and it always has been, and it always will be. You just gave it to me for a little bit of time. And I want to do what's right with it. So that was, I got like, I'm sorry guys, I got like 90 testimonies that are just as good as those. They're all good. Um, so, as it says, a product of discipleship, um, that's what I am. 
Um, where would I have been if he just told me, you know, read the Bible every day, pray every day, you're a great man of God. Now off with you. You know what I mean? Um, he told us to love God and to love people and then to go preach the gospel and go disciple. Are we doing that? That's my thing. Because if you look at me, I am the direct product of being obedient to the Lord and of discipleship. Because I had somebody that I knew was holding me physically accountable for the things I'm doing and the things I'm saying. And this person takes time out of his day to love me and to say, how are you? And we still meet up. I, I call him every Thursday at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.15. And we go over things, and it's just the same things, you know. How's your heart? How is your heart? You know, do you have people in your life that are saying, Bill, how's your heart, man? Is it good? Nathan, how's your heart? What's the Lord been speaking to you, you know? What's, uh, what's next? Give, share a testimony with me. Who'd you, who'd you go out and love? Who did you, did you pray for anybody this week? And it wasn't, and when I used to be in there too, on that atmosphere, I started to do these things too. And I'll, I'll wrap up with this. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Sorry, guys. Um, but I used to stand up on planes and preach the gospel. I used to brrr, machine gun and pray for everybody I could, I could see and touch and talk to. And um, pretty soon this became like my Bible reading plan and my prayer plan. I was doing these things because I felt like I was supposed to. And um, even in those things that you're supposed to do, like reading your Bible every day and praying every day, I was doing those things out of motion and out of habit. And pretty soon those things that made me a great man of God were just motions. They just were motions because my heart wasn't in a spot to where I'm meeting with you because I want to speak with you, because I want to sit with you, because I want to learn from you, because I want to talk with you. I was just checking it off my list. I read my Bible today. I prayed today, and I prayed for five people. And I remember one time I landed in an airplane. Obviously, I didn't land in my car. Um, but I landed landed out the flight, and I, I did what I normally do, and I said, hey, I'm going to... And I looked at the person, and he looked at me like I was crazy, like always. And I just sat back down because I was just doing these things because it's what I know how to do. I wasn't getting up and doing them because I love Jesus. I was getting up and doing them because that's what we do. We stand up and we preach the gospel, right? But my heart wasn't right and in tune and with him, and I wasn't. Because you know, you know what I'm saying? I was doing these things. I was reading my Bible. I was praying, and I was praying for people. But I wasn't being intentional with him. I wasn't looking at him when I was doing these things. So I really encourage you guys, uh, if you love him, if you love me, you'll look at me. That's what he keeps telling me this morning. If you love me, you will just look at me. Um, so in, in your times with the Lord, just look at him. Don't, don't say, God, I thank you for this and help me for that. And just get yourself out of the way and just sit there and be quiet and just wait on his presence. Because once you start to notice his presence, you can start to tune in to how he feels about you and what he has to say to you. And he just has some really cool things that he thinks about you guys. If you guys haven't asked God what he thinks about you, do it. Do it when you're at night and you're quiet and you're not saying anything. You say, God, what do you think about me? How do you feel about me? And then just don't say anything. Just wait for him. You know, they say, wait on the Lord. Wait for him to say, you're funny. You're beautiful. You're kind. You're a good dad. Thank you, Jesus. So I just really want to encourage you guys. Go. Go and do it. Go love somebody. And, you know, it's like, oh, I can't pray for somebody. Uh, you know, maybe you're not comfortable at that atmosphere yet, but you will be. Because I wasn't comfortable reading my Bible, and I wasn't comfortable praying or anything. But the more you do, the more you get comfortable. So it's, there's no agenda. It's just Jesus. So when you go to somebody today, just look them in the eyes and just say, how are you? Are you good? Is your life going good? Is everything fine? Just love people. That's all it takes.